in Beck Me or Basic Dungeons and Dragons, the Red Box D&D set has seven playable character classes. Those character classes, four of them are human, that's the cleric, the fighter, the magic user, and thief, and three of them are demi-human, that's the dwarf, the elf, and the halfling. In Beck Me or Red Box D&D, there are no races, only classes. In this video, we're going to take a look at the human classes, that's going to include the fighter, the cleric, the magic user, and the thief. And in the next video, we will take a look at the dwarf, the elf, and the halfling. Perhaps the most powerful human class that you can play in Redbox or Basic Dungeons & Dragons is the Fighter. And the reason for this are the three areas listed under Other Details on page 28. And that is that the Fighter can wear any type of armor and can use a shield. A Fighter may also use any type of weapon. Now the fighter's hit die is going to be an eight-sided die. So this is going to determine your hit points and the eight-sided die is the highest die roll that you can use for a character class. At levels 1, 2, and 3 in Red Box D&D, we would roll the 8-sided die, which in this case is a 3, and then we would add our Constitution bonus. Now, experience points play an important role in Basic Dungeons & Dragons, and each character class has what's called a Prime Requisite, and the Prime Requisite for a Fighter is Strength. So if a fighter has a strength score of 13 or more, then they're going to get either a 5% or a 10% bonus to their experience points when they finish an adventure. Now again, we're only covering levels 1 through 3. So looking at the fighter experience table, a level 1 fighter is a veteran. Level 2 fighter requires 2,000 experience points and is a warrior. And level 3 fighter requires 4,000 experience points and is a sword master. These are called level titles. A fighter's saving throws for death ray or poison and down are 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And a fighter has no other special abilities. Now a cleric, very similar to a fighter, they can wear any type of armor and can use a shield. However, with regards to weapons, a cleric cannot use any weapon with a sharp edge. This is forbidden by the cleric's beliefs. A cleric may only use a mace, a club, a warhammer, or a sling. Now for hit dice or hit points, a cleric will roll a six-sided die and add their constitution bonus. So in this case, I would roll a five for five hit points and then add the constitution bonus. Now, even though one of these special abilities of a cleric is to be able to cast spells, they're unable to do so at first level. Looking at our cleric experience table, a first level cleric is known as an acolyte and they cannot cast any cleric spells. A second level cleric is achieved at 1500 experience points so they level up a little bit faster than fighters. They become an adept, that's their level title, and they can cast one first level cleric spell. A third level cleric reaches that at 3000 experience points, becomes a priest or priestess, and can cast two first level cleric spells. Now, I am not going to go over the cleric spells in this video, but if you like this Beck Me tutorial series and would like to see it continue, and you would like to see me cover cleric spells in a future video, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below. Now, the saving throws for a cleric are just a tad bit better than a fighter, as we start at, with an 11 for death row or poison, and we have 12, 14, 16, and 15. The prime requisite for a cleric is wisdom, so a cleric with a 13 wisdom or higher is going to gain a bonus when they get experience points. Now, in addition to spells, a cleric has an ability called turning undead. Now, a turned monster will not touch the cleric and will flee as far away from him or her as possible. The way that I would run turned monsters in my basic Dungeons & Dragons games is that the monster would just flee and keep running from room to room to keep getting as far away as it can from the cleric. Now, in order to turn undead, we have a cleric turning undead table, and this table gets better every time the cleric goes up a level. So at level one, a cleric has a seven, nine, 11, and an N. So a seven for a skeleton is going to be dependent on a die roll. So if the cleric encounters undead, they're going to roll two D6. That's going to be a three and a one. That's going to be a four. And for a cleric to turn a skeleton at first level, they're going to need to roll a seven or higher. It's a 2d6 system, so they're going to fail at turning undead. 
However, if they do roll a 7 or higher, then those skeletons are going to be turned, and that's going to be up to the Dungeon Master. So now, after the Cleric turns the Undead, the Dungeon Master is going to roll two six-sided dice, and that many hit dice of skeletons are going to be turned. So while this is a high roll here, there's always a possibility when a Cleric turns Undead that not all of the Undead are going to flee and run away. Now in our table, as we can see here at levels 2 and 3, to turn a skeleton we have a T. That means that the player does not have to roll 2d6. Those turns are going to immediately take effect and we're simply going to have the Dungeon Master roll 2d6 to determine how many hit die of those undead are going to be turned. So for example, a third level cleric is going to automatically turn four hit dice of skeletons. Skeletons are a one hit die monster, so this will cause four skeletons to turn and flee and run away. And as you can see, there are some undead that have an N in the chart, and that means that a cleric of that level cannot turn that undead. And finally, as a reminder, we are in the red box, Dungeons and Dragons, so we're only covering levels one through three. So after the red box, the cleric turning undead table is going to get significantly better. On page 37, we're going to be introduced to the magic user. Now, the magic user is arguably one of the weakest classes at the beginning levels and basic Dungeons and Dragons. A magic user is unable to wear any type of armor and cannot use a shield. A magic user can only use a dagger for a weapon. For hit dice or hit points at first level, a magic user is only going to be able to roll a four-sided die and add their constitution bonus. So in this roll here, our magic user would only have two hit points and plus whatever their constitution bonus might be. The prime requisite for a magic user is intelligence, so if a magic user has an intelligence of 13 or more, then they're going to get a bonus to their experience points when those are acquired. Saving throws for a magic user starts with a 13 for death ray or poison, and then goes down 14, 13, 16, and 15. Now the magic user experience table starts off with a level 1 magic user with a level title of a medium, and they have first level spell, 1 first level spell, so they better make it count. Now the magic user takes a lot more experience points than all of the other three human classes, so they need 2,500 experience points to be able to go up to level 2. At level 2, their title is a seer, and they will be able to cast two first level spells. At level 3, it's going to require 5,000 experience points. They will be known as a conjurer, and they can cast two first level spells plus one second level spell. Now we are not going to go over spells in this video, but if that is something that you would like to see, be sure to subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below that you would like to see this introduction to Beck Me series continue, and we will go over the magic user spells in a different video. Our final human class is the Thief, and that's found on page 43. Now, a Thief can only wear leather armor, so that will give them an armor class of 7, and they cannot use a shield. Now, with regards to weapons, a Thief can use any missile weapon and any other weapon usable with one hand. Two-handed weapons are prohibited. So, in this case, our Thief could use a bow and arrow, or they could use something like a short sword. For hit points or hit dice, our thief, very much like our magic user, is only going to roll a d4. So on this die roll, we're going to have 4 hit points plus whatever our constitution modifier might be. Now the prime requisite of a thief is going to be dexterity. So if our thief has a 13 or more in dexterity, then they'll get a 5 or 10% bonus when it comes time to calculate experience points. Now, thieves level up the fastest out of all four of our human classes. They only need 1,200 experience points to go to level 2. So, at level 1, they start as an apprentice. At level 2, they become a footpad. And at 2,400 experience points, they become a level 3 robber. Now, our thief also has a table of special abilities. Those special abilities are to open locks, and those are done with thieves' tools. So, our thief will have to make sure that they purchase thieves' tools. If they don't have those, they won't be able to use this. They can also find traps. They can remove traps. They can climb walls. They can move silently. 
they can hide in shadows, they can pick pockets, and they can hear noise. Let's take a closer look at these. With open locks, this can be tried once per lock, and only with thieves tools that are carried. The thief may not try again with that lock until gaining another level of experience. So you just get one shot at it. Find traps may also be tried only once per trap. If a trap is found, the thief may attempt to remove it. Remove traps may only be tried if a trap is found. It may only be tried once per trap. To climb walls, this applies to any steep surfaces such as sheer cliffs, walls, and so forth. The chances for success are good, but if failed, the thief slips at the halfway point and falls. The DM will roll for success only once for every 100 feet climb. If failed, the thief takes 1d6 points of damage per 10 feet fallen. Failure during a 10 foot climb would inflict 1 point of damage. Move silently will always seem successful to the thief, however the DM will know based on the percentage roll whether the thief's movement is actually heard by nearby enemies, who may then take appropriate action. Hide in shadows means that the thief moves into and remains in shadows, also using neutral concealment. Movement is possibly hiding but not attacking, the attempt will always seem successful to the thief, but only the DM will know for sure. Pickpockets may be risky if the DM rolls a number greater than twice the given chance for success. The thief is not only seen by those nearby, but is caught in the act by the intended victim, who may, and often does, react unfavorably. Hear noise, checked using a D6, applies both to listening at doors and hearing the footsteps of approaching monsters. However, there is too much noise during battles to hear anything unusual. So I find it interesting in basic Dungeons & Dragons that when we roll a percentile roll or a D6 for hear noise, that the Dungeon Master is the one that rolls for the thieves' abilities. Now, if I were the Dungeon Master running a basic D&D game, I would probably do the roll for things like move silently and hide in shadows, but I would allow the thief or whoever is playing the thief to do the die roll for open locks and find traps and climb walls. So the way that the thieves abilities work, as we can see by level of experience, each of them have a number. So let's take for example open locks, at level 1 is a 15, level 2 is a 20, level 3 is a 25. So what we do is we roll our d10 twice, so I roll an 8 and an 8, and that number has to be equal to or less than the number indicated. So in this case, I would not be able to open that lock, and I cannot try again until I gain another level of experience. So if my character wants to hide in shadows, let's say we have a level 3 that is trying to hide in shadows, that's a 20, so I'm going to roll a 2 and a 1. That just barely misses because we need a 20 or lower, and so the dungeon master is going to say you hide in the shadows, but we're not going to be able to know for sure if our hide in shadows was successful. And according to the DM's roll, it was absolutely not. If you have any further questions about the thief's special ability table, be sure to leave them in the comments below. Now one more ability that the thief has is called backstabbing. If a thief can sneak up on a victim completely unnoticed, then the thief may perform a backstab. If the intended victim sees, hears, or is otherwise warned of the thief's approach, a backstab may not be taken, but the thief may still attack normally. When backstabbing, the thief gains a bonus of a plus four on the hit roll, and if the target is a hit, the damage done is twice normal. Now in order to perform a backstab, that is also going to be up to the dungeon master. The thief doesn't necessarily need to be hiding in the shadows or moving silently to be able to sneak up on a creature, let's say like an ogre. Perhaps the rest of the party has their attention and the thief is behind the ogre, and in this case, then I would allow for the backstab. And once again, how the backstab works is we would roll a d20, so that would be a 19 plus 4, that would be a 23, which is definitely going to hit. And then we would roll our damage, let's say it's that's a short sword, so that would be a 4 plus 4, so that would be 8 points of damage. So those are the four human classes that you're going to find in the original Mensa Red Box Basic Dungeons & Dragons. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the three demi-human classes that you can play in this game. If you are enjoying this series and would like to see it continue, please subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below. Thank you very much for watching, and on to the next.